Well, that's a tough act to follow. Um, okay, so uh, this is a remarkable conference, and I have to say that I've learned an enormous amount over the last couple of days. Um, thanks to Professor Christians for letting me in the room. Um, so, um, let me start with entitlement. Um, so, like Professor um, Vidal, um, I probably wake up every morning and think about how fortunate I am to have been born where I was and to have the opportunities that I and my family have. Um, in fact, had my grandparents not chosen to come over to the United States, um, I and my family probably wouldn't exist. And along with that entitlement, um, I'm sorry, along with that feeling, I'm glad to pay my taxes, and always have been. Um, so that's the first place that we have to start. The second place I think that we should go is to sharing and shared experience. Now, um, since I've been in Montreal, um, so on Tuesday, um, I shared the experience of the firefighters and police protest by City Hall. Um, so that was an interesting experience. Um, last night, um, I enjoyed the French rocker M uh, for free out in the, um, what's it called, the... Huh? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah, there's more of that tonight that I intend to go to. Okay? So, that's a shared experience that I have with, with Montrealers. Um, now, what if um, you get together with some of your friends and you each chip in um, let's say $300 a piece, because you decide that you want to have a really special dinner. Um, and, you know, whatever it happens to be a pleasure, you, you buy the ad some very nice wine, um, and you get your table set up. And as you're ready to go through the buffet that you've set up and take your dinner, uh, several homeless people come in and start serving themselves at this very expensive buffet that you've just set up. Well, you should think for a moment about how you might feel about that, okay? Now, I love Sweden. Um, I speak Swedish, I read Swedish. I mean, heck, I even read uh, Steve Larsen's Millennium Trilogy in the original. <laughs> um, so, you know, I've got nothing against Sweden. Back in the um, early, in the, well, actually late 60s, when I first started having contact with Sweden, um, Sweden was developing its welfare system. The backbone of the Swedish welfare system was progressive taxation. Um, now, let's see, was um, Professor, was it West? Vesselberg, um, excuse me one second, I have a note on that, and I've now misplaced it. Um, okay, so one of the speakers yesterday was, was pointing out to us how you can't raise enough tax or um, without taxing the less wealthy. Okay, and I apologize for missing the name, I forget it. I'm sorry about that. Um, so, um, there it is. Um, okay. Pardon? Kesselman. Kesselman. Okay. So, yeah. Okay. <laughs> and it's clear to me that you've got to tax less wealthy people as well as wealthy people. You simply can't raise enough revenue any other way. Um, but Sweden was really committed to progressive taxation. And the underlying concept was that people shouldn't be that rich. So Sweden had a more than 85% income tax rate, and I say more than because it had different rates in different parts of Sweden. It had an estate tax of more than 80%. And in addition to that, it had an annual wealth tax of 2.5%. 
And that situation continued until about 1990. That's fairly recent. Um, currently, the top rate on the Swedish income tax is about 55%. Sweden no longer has an estate or inheritance tax. And most recently, Sweden repealed its wealth tax. It has shifted its taxation from taxes on capital and wealth to taxes on labor. It has a social security tax of about 7% that is highly regressive because it peaks at 7% up to a certain level and then drops to zero, uh, much like the United States of security tax. It has a 25% value added tax. Can't get much more regressive than that, although Sweden does have graduated rates in the value added tax. Some things, though I haven't determined what the rational basis is for all of them. Um, some rates go as low as 7%, and there's a 12% rate on some things, but the fact of the matter is the value added tax is regressive <clears throat> and is a tax on labor as well as the um, social security tax. So, so what happened? So why did Sweden go this way? Um, and I think Sweden is a proxy for lots of places. I mean, Sweden's a very remarkable place. Sweden has a really strong welfare state. It's had it for a long time. It's, it's the model of the world in a welfare state. It provides cradle-to-grave services. Sweden has been a leader in um, gender equality. Um, paid parity in Sweden rose more quickly than anywhere else, except, incidentally, Norway surpassed Sweden this year. But hey, that's the way it goes, right? Uh, Norway is over 90% right now in, in paid parity. At least the study that I saw from the um, uh, the ombudsman study, and Sweden even has a minister of equality. So I was wondering about that and and thinking about you know how did Sweden shift from this commitment to progressive taxation um, to extremely regressive taxation. I said, okay, well, you know, I can find all kinds of explanations, right? I mean, there's international tax competition. I mean, come on, everybody's doing it, so why shouldn't Sweden do it? And why shouldn't the rich people in Sweden get to keep their wealth? So that's certainly a possible explanation. But what else changed in Sweden? In the late 80s, Sweden began to accept um, immigration from the Arab states and from places like Somalia. A lot of immigration. Before that, Sweden had been extremely homogeneous. When I first went to Sweden in about 1969, actually earlier, uh, 66, it was essentially a very, very white Christian society. When I lived there for a year, um, in the very early 70s, um, Sweden was still the same way. Um, there was some immigration in the 50s um, from Southern Europe, a guest worker system, um, but it was still pretty much a white Christian country. In fact, the church provided certain governmental services um, so that when we got there, we had to be um, inscribed to the church book um, in order to get our benefits. So we didn't expect what we got. Them. And, you know, we even got a child, thing, a child supplement um, because we had our youngest child with us at the, uh, and our only child with us at the time. Um, so this was just, you know, it was great to participate in this welfare system. But 
When I look at the change in immigration patterns, I wonder, and I'm asking the question now, and whether this is part of what's going on in other places as well, I kind of wonder whether this immigration, people that don't look like us, are starting to make us feel uncomfortable or make the Swedes feel uncomfortable. And, you know, it's fine to share with people who look a lot like you and who have all these shared experiences like you with you. But when they get different, then maybe you're not quite as willing to share. And the political will that kept the progressive tax system in place begins to dissipate. Now, there's a considerable sociological literature in Sweden um, that says, that suggests that while the welfare state is extremely sticky, the delivery of welfare services has um, both racial and sexual biases built in. Um, not in the terms of the system, but in the delivery of the benefits. Um, so that there are certain built-in biases, for example, that people coming from certain cultures, that, they're, um, that the women in the family will take care of the elderly. And so they don't provide them the same um, elder care that Sweden might provide to other people in a society. So I think it's a question worth asking because Maybe, maybe there's a way to overcome this sense of entitlement that we might get because we live in a place in a wealthy country. And, but we have to recognize at first that that's actually what we're doing. And I think that'll do it for me. Thank you.